you for the introduction. So, um, starting off, so I joined the lab in May 2016, and it's uh, the sixth PIF, meanwhile, if you don't count the CT reconstruction workshop. Now, since last time, a few things got published, notably for uh, this one archive paper, which I consider a valid publication because we won a prize on it, and my medical physics paper about the beam hardening correction, and a paper at ICCV, which I will talk about in the following 10 minutes. Now, I have submitted another paper, which will also be part uh, of this talk. It's the projective reconstruction for output correspondences. And I currently prepare a larger work on all my research in the past years, which you can find over here. Um, so wh what, am I, wh what am I talking about about acquisition geometry? Wh what is this? So for, for CT reconstruction, we need raw data, which we measure. But what we also need is calibration data on the geometry of our CT system. And that calibration data specifies how our um, operator, which we need to invert, is actually built up. So this geometry is usually built up by projection matrices and um, specifies how source and detector move. Now, if we don't get this calibrated data right, like there can be two cases which this occurs. For example, there's involuntary patient motion. You can see that our, our reconstructions, which should look like this, will be, uh, get degraded by uh, artifacts, like streaking artifacts, which you see on the right side. Now, this is not only about patient motion, it is also about non-reproducible scanner trajectories. So if your scanner, which you calibrate, is not able to reconstruct, so to use the same trajectory again, you get the same problems. Both artifacts are, in the end, caused by your projection matrix not matching your projection data. Now, if you look to a, a related field, which is the field of computer vision, we can actually find that, for example, you see this reconstruction of the Colosseum. And they did this reconstruction based on random images of, of people who uploaded it in on the internet. Now, they can do this because their algorithms, they often termed like structure for motion, they estimate the 3D reconstruction and the acquisition geometry at the same time. The working horse for this um, to actually work is they establish point correspondences. So I sampled two random images from the Colosseum. And what you can see here is that for some points in those images, you can actually find corresponding points in other images. Those things are called point correspondences, and those computer vision algorithms rely heavily on them. The reason why they rely heavily on them is they, use, they often use it to build up the relative geometry of projections in the beginning. So what you see here is that a, pro a corresponding point, like x1 here, will actually is the, the projection of the same 3D point in the 3D reconstruction. Now there's another thing. So if you connect the, the source of the, the X-ray projections, you get a thing called the baseline. And where this baseline intersects the detectors, there will the, be the so-called epipoles, which I uh, will refer to later. Now, the epipoles and any point can, use to, uh, can be used to define a line, which is called an epipolar line. Now, any point has to lie on a corresponding epipolar line in the other projection. And this geometry is fully described by a single matrix called the fundamental matrix. Now, if we want to apply this to, if we want to transfer this to X-ray images, we, we started wi with the problem of like having to determine corresponding points. Now, I brought you an example here of a phantom. So there are some metal beads with the, uh, different densities in here, and you're now tasked with finding correspondences. So some of them are literally impossible because they are in the air, but even for those, it's kind of really, really hard. So we can apply the computer vision algorithm, and we can estimate a fundamental matrix, which gives us this result. Is it correct? Well, I don't know, but let's look at the ground truth. So on the left side, the estimated epipolar geometry. On the right side, the ground truth. So what we see is it's kind of a random result, and that's not surprising because the point matching fails completely. So and that leads me to the, to uh, the topic of this talk. I want to estimate fundamental matrices without point correspondences. How do I do this? I refer back to the epipolar geometry, which you seen before, and I've just highlighted the, the so-called epipolar plane here. The idea is, since we're working in X-ray imaging, we're acquire, uh, what we want to reconstruct is the 3D distribution of the linear attenuation coefficient. 
Now, if we, if we think about this epipolar plane and all the attenuation contained in this plane, if we have an integral over this whole plane accumulating all the attenuation, it should be the same no matter from which detector we measure all this attenuation. So meaning an integral over the epipolar lines should be the same as the integral over the plane, the same as the integral over the corresponding epipolar line which is not true in cone beam geometry because there is a, a weighting factor going on but we have already learned we can correct for this um, using a derivative in the orthogonal direction of this plane. Now using this so-called consistency condition what I, what I want to do next is I want to parameterize my epipolar lines and what I do for this is like I use a space curve so it's now some arbitrary space curve think of a circle on my detector it has a single parameter and what I use next is an epipole. Now we've learned any point on the detector and the epipole will give us an epipolar line. This means I can parameterize using now homogeneous coordinates, I can parameterize all my epipolar lines by the cross product of um, the, the space curve and the epipole. So this gives all possible epipolar lines in any geometric setup. Now Looking into Hartley Sisserman's uh, book on this, we can transfer the epipolar lines on one detector to epipolar lines in the other detector using an, uh, an homography just defined by the fundamental matrix because that one defines the geometry fully. Now I brought you a little image what, what I just parameterized. What, what did I just do? This is um, the intermediate space where I have like every point is a derivative of a line integral. And the curve I just parameterized you see here in a color. And what our consistency condition says, if I have the right geometry, then any, point, any corresponding points on those two curves, they should be identical. So what I now do is I formulate an optimization problem which uses this parameterization of the space curves and says like the difference between the samples needs to be zero if I have the right geometry. So now I have a cost function only depending on the fundamental matrix and I can uh, pose the estimation of this fundamental matrix simply by a optimization problem just dependent on the fundamental matrix subject to the rank constraint. Does it work? Well, so here you have an image where I, there is my algorithm which estimated the epipolar geometry without point of correspondence. On the right you find the ground truth. So visually we're doing very good. And actually the numerical results back this up. Now fundamental matrices are not our geometry which we want in the end. So what we want to do now is we want to reconstruct the, the geometry of our scene only using fundamental matrices. And it turns out that if we have a single fundamental matrix, there's actually a formula to uh, just solve this. We can reconstruct a projective reconstruction of the two projection matrices from a single fundamental matrix with those equa uh, equations. Now, for if we want to have more projections added to this, there is another formula which says, if I have two projection matrices already estimated and I have two connecting fundamental matrices to an unknown projection, the uh, multiplication of all those quantities should be skew-symmetric. Now you may, uh, might ask, what is matrix A? I, I haven't introduced it. Reason is, it is unknown, but it is skew-symmetric. So this means some entries need to be zero and some entries need to be negative of other entries, which basically boils down to I get 10 equations from this property on my unknown projection matrix and I get another 10 from the other fundamental matrix leaving me with 20 equations which is more than enough to estimate the missing projection matrix. Now I can recursively do the same thing to reconstruct basically any solvable such viewing graph of projection matrices. The problem is the problem is already overdetermined. I have told you it's like 20, equa uh, 20 equations and my pro projection matrix has very few uh, unknowns. So this problem is overconstrained and actually becomes even more complicated because there is lots of fundamental matrices which I can compute which overconstrain it even more. So the problem is again like this. I have an overconstrained setting and if those fundamental matrices are not estimated ideally then I will be in this setting so my fundamental matrices will not be consistent so they will not specify the geometry which, is, which actually exists. So what I did to counter this is I adapted a global optimization method of Kastnedal which was recently um, uh, proposed to actually map to a consistent set of projection matrices 
reconstructing my whole geometry based on the fundamental matrices. And actually that concludes my talk. There is so what I presented you is like now we are able to do um, a projective reconstruction simply based on the imaging data. There is some limitations. So what I currently re still rely on is an initialization because I have a non-convex optimization problem. So I need to investigate what to do about this initialization. How can I come up with a good initial estimate? Um, I need to characterize this optimization problem even further and I have currently not modeled any physical effects. So lots of future work to do. And, but I still believe like this is, a, this is a fundamental new idea which could enable us to build new way cheaper CT scanners which don't have a reproducible trajectory and are resistant to rigid motion by design. So thanks for listening and do you have any questions?